here, everybody. It's Tyler here at the Championship, checking in team number 1325, Inverse Paradox. An absolutely phenomenal season. Uh, they have a blue banner already and are also finalists at Ontario DCMP. Congratulations on a great season so far. Take a look at Inverse Paradox, what they have to offer. I love the compactness of this robot as they've gone through. Of course, we'll be talking about using Swerve for the first time, the wrists that they have as we go through their arm, some cool positional control, and a little bit more about programming coming up here on Behind the Bumpers. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your educational robotics needs. From mechanical, electrical, tools, and hardware, Animark has over 200 years of first-team experience and offers high-quality and affordable solutions for the robotics mobility and competition markets. Head on over to Animark.com to get started. If your team is using SOLIDWORKS, make sure you log into the 3D Experience platform to gain access to tutorials, collaborate with other users, and download the charge up field and kit up parts. Go to SOLIDWORKS.com first and click on Log into 3D Experience platform to gain access. Ashwin, let's start off. Your team is using Swerve for the first time, as we've seen uh, many teams doing it. So I'd love to hear more about your experience for it and uh, any advice for teams who are looking at getting into Swerve too. Uh, yeah, so this is our first year, uh, as you said, using Swerve. Uh, we noticed that last year uh, we had a tank drive and we were getting destroyed by a lot of other teams that had Swerve. Uh, so we thought it would be a good update and it would be a good like introduction to our team as we've never done this before. So actually in our off season, uh, after last uh, season, we decided to try it out and use it like as a drive base in practice. And it actually like worked really well and we enjoyed using it and it was really easy to use and program and stuff. Um, our drive base is really small, like it's a square, it's 26 by 26 inches. Uh, and it, we decided to go small because it's easy to um, move around and like like sw swerve around defense, obviously. And also since the game field is mainly open, uh, it's easy to move around, basically. So as you're looking at using it first time, if you have other teams that are trying to use Swerve, maybe they want to start in their off season or something, what advice have you have learned that you want to give to those teams? Um, for advice, I'd rather just, uh, it's, it's really helpful. I really recommend using it since, especially, uh, for this season, it's really helpful. Uh, most teams this, this season that don't have it are really like struggling a bit. Uh, but if you're trying to get into Swerve, I really recommend it because uh, it's just a cool project. Like we did uh, last off season, we made like a little robot for last like season, the game last season, and we noticed that it really improved our robot a lot. So it would be a really good project, and it would improve your team a lot. Ruby, let's start to hop in on this robot here. Starting out, uh, you have your intake here, and I, I really like the wrist that your team is building to employ yeah. as well. So talking about some of the structure, how you come up with it, and anything we can demo for it too would be awesome. Yeah, so just in terms of the claw itself, when we went about prototyping it, we went through a lot of versions in order to get something that was not only as light as possible, but also packaged as small as possible. So we actually have a couple of pictures of just our early prototypes. So we started with like a slider claw, and we found it was heavy because it used a chain, and it didn't package that nice because it had to be really wide. Went to a one pivot claw and it was super light, but we couldn't package it nice. And then we ended up with a two pivot claw, which is similar to what we ended up with. And it's kind of like the one pivot claw and the slider claw, but it has the best of both worlds. What you'll see here actually is that this doesn't actually have the pivots anymore. So here and here used to be the pivots. And what we've done now is we've just made it a completely static claw. And our first two competitions, we had it so that it was sprung closed and it would open and close and it would have that active um, motion. But instead, now we found after our second event that you could actually just um, keep it at this specific uh, length away. And that way, the cones and the cubes would still completely intake perfectly and they'd sit right up here. Except we have a wider range of area that we can actually intake from. So that was really helpful and it was a really interesting iterative process, especially just for this claw. And then just a little bit about the wrist as well. We actually went about making this wrist. We have the Falcon and the gearbox up here and the torque is transmitted through aircraft cable. We decided to go for aircraft cable because it gave us a lot of freedom on where we wanted to put like our gearbox in terms of like how far instead of rather a belt where you would ha be really constricted to where you could put that motor. And it was also light and also the tensile strength was really strong. So it kind of fit all of our needs and that's why we decided to do it. So this pulley and that pulley are made in-house on the lathe. And then we just have this cable that runs down. Uh, I want to ask you, when you're looking at uh, approaching this game here, yeah. uh, from your intake wise on it, uh, you know, I watch your team, you're able to cycle so well yeah. as you go through on that. Um, why, when you were approaching it, like we've seen teams do super wide intakes, we've seen teams do super narrow. This seems kind of a in between, like when you were looking at the game, how did this end up being the best solution for uh, Inverse Paradox? Yeah, so actually we really wanted to do an auxiliary intake. So we wanted to have kind of an intake, just like a rapid reaction sure, intake. Yeah. 
What we did was we, we used our 2022 robot and we tried intaking a cone and we were absolutely shocked that it worked and it was working pretty consistently. So we did a lot of prototyping on that and we kind of just got through it and didn't have enough time to finish and finalize these prototypes. So we kind of worked on it during, build se during comp season as well and it never really came to fruition just because we didn't find a need for it after we had kind of used this so much and done so much practice with it. We just thought it would be really complex to add a new subsystem, have to practice with it, and all of that. So we kind of just stuck with what we had because we found that it worked. And, that Absolutely. Was it. and it has been working, right? Yeah. So Absolutely. I mean, let's talk about on your uh, arm itself as we start to go into that. Uh, I know we talked a little about the uh, the pulley here as well, but talking about the general superstructure of it, yeah. uh, how it's been working on it. If we can see the arm come out a little bit, kind of showcase that, uh, would be awesome, Yeah, so too. fashion, if you want to do that real quick. Yeah, so, uh, so this is the floor pickup. And this is the home position. And that's our stowed position. Yep. And this is the uh, low position. Uh, this is the mid position. And I'm not sure if we can go high because of the banner, but yeah. This that's is, fair. We'll yeah. trust you on yeah. that. So. Yeah. And if you look at what, uh, if you actually look at this pivot right here, you can actually end up seeing that there's actually, uh, obviously we talked about the wrist before. There's actually a pivot up here, which is we, we call it our elbow joint. And then we have our shoulder joint right at the bottom down here. Um, and these, all these, all these joints were initially uh, decided, or like the lengths of these arms uh, or segments were decided using a spreadsheet that we had uh, created right on the first day. Uh, and w using that spreadsheet, we were able to figure out what lengths of the arms and where these joints would be. That would, and what, which, what would work for us to actually be able to place these cones and cubes in the nodes uh, and positions that we wanted to wanted it to be. Once we had that, we ended up taking it into. Um, we ended up calculating the stall loads and we took it into the JVN design calculator to actually figure out what we wanted our gear ratios to look like to make sure we're actually able to uh, manipulate the arm and, and transmit enough torque to actually uh, do what we just we, we just showed you guys uh, and, and actually move these uh, move these joints to the positions we want them to. Uh, as you can see here, one of the iterations we had on our arm this year is that, or actually just for this competition, is that we added a gas shock right here, which is um, actually uh, gravity neutral. So what what happens is when it's when it's off, we're able to uh, lift the arm up, and and it doesn't actually try and fall down because of the fact that the gas shock, the pressure in the gas shock, uh, ne neutralizes the effects of gravity. Uh, looking down at our gearboxes. Um, and we can talk about our shoulder gearbox uh, down here. We have we have a Versa planetary, so that's that's our Versa planetary, and that's actually our Falcon right there. Uh, and what this and and if you look at the plate, it's actually connected via just this plate right here. Um, and what we have inside our plate is a custom made uh, pocket that we designed ourselves to allow us to connect the Vers Versa planetary to the Falcon. So the pocket looks like this. So that's the pocket, um, and it just and it and it and it has a couple of holes inside it that allow it to fit into this into the screw pockets of these of the Versa planetary, and once it's put together, we're able to integrate that into the into the um, gearbox plates itself, and then connect the Falcon to the other holes, uh, which allows us to uh, actually create this small form factor of our gearbox that we have today. Another cool thing about our gearboxes is that it, uh, is that they all have tensioners involved inside them. So here we have a we have a tensioner pr pressing on this chain right here that uh, keeps the tension from uh, from this from this gear reduction from here all the way up there and makes sure that this chain when it stretches doesn't actually lose its uh, ability to transmit torque. Uh, and, and you can also see the same thing going on right over there. Uh, along with that, we also have uh, we. We, we basically integrated that Versa planetary connection at all of our gearboxes. So we have it up there. We have it into this plate right here. And then we finally have it uh, obviously down at the shoulder right there. Uh, and all of this was obviously catted uh, because we don't we don't we want to make sure that before we're able to um, before we finally produce it, we actually have an idea of what it's going to look like and what it ends up being being. And it's been working out, like I said, your team's been doing so well. So obviously all this has been working out really well. By the way, I, I love the gas shock. There's so many teams. We've talked to a couple here that are using it, but it's like, I don't get why more teams aren't doing yeah. that. It, it seems like it makes, especially for this year, like it makes so much sense on that. Yeah. Uh, as we start to uh, finish up on this route, uh, in retro, as we talk about uh, the programming on the bot as well, too, what's gone into that. I know we're going to show it off a little bit on your uh, driver station as well, too. So talk to me about what's gone into it from that aspect of things. Sure, yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, the first thing that a lot of people ask is, uh, why do we have three line blades? So uh, we've actually made sticky notes. So uh, I'll just go over from this side to this side. 
So first we have the Limelight 3. So this uh, targets the mid cone uh, nodes as well as the left April tags. So whenever we're a line, we're, we're starting in auto, uh, if we're starting at a cone node, or sorry, in front of a cone node, uh, what will happen is that some, like if we just had this, we wouldn't be able to see the cone node on, I believe, the red side. So that's why this also exists in order to get it on the red side as well. Uh, after that, so for the, uh, this one also manages the high, uh, high cone target alignment. So these are both using retroflective tape for that. The way how it works is that it we basically, uh, instead of using like normal uh, line like crosshair stuff, we keep the crosshair where it is, but instead we calculate the distances from the limelight to the actual target. So then we can uh, think, basically put in uh, put it as a position and then use odometry in order to track ourselves and move to the actual cone target. Uh, so this uh, basically allows us to, uh, to do auto alignment as well as auto score. So basically what the driver has to do is that they have to go like around the uh, thing, the cone target, and then after that, they can just click one button. It'll automatically align. Once it notices it's aligned, it'll automatically score it and then hand back control to the driver. Uh, finally, we have this limelight. So this is this is a limelight two plus, and this is a limelight two. So this is a game piece alignment. So basically, at the start of auto, what we'll do is that uh, we'll actually use this in order to uh, think uh, align to a cone or a cube that's uh, uh, there. Uh, we only use this for auto. We currently don't use this for teleop, but yeah. So that's all the vision stuff. Uh, now I'm gonna go over the uh, thing, uh, actual like arm. So our arm is has a lot of complex control stuff. So basically what we do, so in, instead of uh, making the driver like uh, manually adjust the angles on every single motor, uh, what we do instead is that we use uh, inverse kinematics to say that, okay, let's say I want the end effector or like the tip of the end effector to be over here, right? So what, uh, like what joint angles or what angles do the joints have to be at in order for that uh, thing, for an, in order for the end effector to be at that position, right? So we use, uh, think, both uh, inverse kinematics and kinematics for that. So you can see like a sample of the kinematics calculations that we use. Uh, it's a good amount of matrix math. Uh, yeah. Uh, so after being able to know like uh, where the like, uh, how to move the, uh, the end effector, sorry, the claw and the arm, uh, of course, we need to follow paths in order to get it from one place to the other, right? So we use uh, our own custom uh, homemade uh, path GUI tool that we used to use for our swerve drivetrain instead. Uh, we actually use it for both now, but I can show you the UI over here. So this is just the UI for our swerve, uh, swerve uh, drivetrain. So if we want, I'll just load in a path. So let's say blue... Sorry about this, uh, upper path three. There we go. So we can see that we just put in waypoints and then the green line will automatically, I uh, think, create a kinematically like uh, uh, a line or like a path that follows the kinematic restriction. So if we right click on this, we can see that we can actually input the yaw that the robot, sh or the yaw that it should approach the uh, point at, as well as the speed, acceleration, that kind of stuff. Uh, you can also just create new points, that kind of, uh, yep. And then after that, uh, we use the same application, uh, but basically uh, flip it from the X and Y axis to the X and Z axis for our arm. So if we click here. Oh, oof. Okay, there we go. So if we load in a path, let me just... There we go. Yeah, so we basically do the same thing on our arm, just with a different uh, uh, GUI, I guess. So here, we just put in our waypoints and here it's going from stowed to high Q, yeah. So we can move these around and we can see how it works. So it automatically generates a path. And then we use basically the same uh, swerve, uh, we use the uh, same path following algorithm that we use on our uh, drivetrain uh, for our arm. Uh, so yeah, it's basically kind of similar to Pure Pursuit in the way that it'll look for the next waypoint and then it'll just uh, kind of go towards that, or the closest waypoint, sorry. Well, yeah. Inverse Paradox, you have a phenomenal machine here. Love hearing about everything that's got into it. So thank you. I love the demonstrations that you have ready as well too. Like, thanks to show off. I was wondering what the sticky notes meant by the way too at one point. So awesome to hear. So thank you so much for talking to us about this. Wish you best of luck here at World Championships, but congratulations on a great season so far. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. 
If your team is using SOLIDWORKS, make sure you log into the 3D Experience platform to gain access to tutorials, collaborate with other users, and download the charge up field and kit up parts. Go to SOLIDWORKS.com first and click on Log into 3D Experience platform to gain access. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your educational robotics needs. From mechanical, electrical, tools, and hardware, Animark has over 200 years of first-team experience and offers high-quality and affordable solutions for the robotics mobility and competition markets. Head on over to Animark.com to get started. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.